So people keep coming, so I have to. Good morning, everyone. We're just getting everybody in here uh, and welcome to uh, our next webinar. I am just going to ask if it doesn't do it automatically for you, if you could just please mute your microphone just so we avoid any background noises. We're just gonna give a few minutes for everybody to get logged in here. We had a number, I think we had 50 people register. So we're just gonna give them one or two more minutes to log in and then we will get started. So thank you all for logging in and joining us. So we'll be just one moment. All right, we've got 27 people logged in. We'll give one more minute and then we will uh, we'll get started. So thanks everybody for joining us. We uh, are excited to have so far over 30 of you logged in and joining us. So this is the second session that we've had um, with Richard from the Hortha Pine Ridge District Health Unit. Uh, our first was yesterday on reopening and operating your business safely. And today's session is really specific to restaurants, events, and entertainment. So. Uh, hopefully you'll find the information presented today helpful and relative to what it is that you're working on. I'm just going to, this is what the agenda looks like today. Uh, so I'm going to do an introduction to your hosts. There's a number of partners that came together to be able to bring this session to you today. I'm going to talk really quickly about what economic recovery looks like in Kawartha Lakes. And then uh, I'm gonna pass it on over to Richard, who is uh, with the health unit, and he's gonna go into his presentation uh, and talk about a number of different sort of avenues on how you can operate safely during COVID-19 and uh, in this sort of recovery and reopening efforts, uh, as many of you either haven't been able to operate or have been doing things a little bit differently over the last little while. After Richard's presentation, we're gonna have the opportunity for uh, a question and answer period. And then we'll do a quick poll just to get your feedback on the session and we will wrap up. So uh, firstly, I should say, my name is Carly. I am with the Economic Development Department with the city and uh, we have uh, partnered with a number of people. So I've got their logos coming up here. 
A few housekeeping things to begin with. If you haven't already, just double check that your microphone is muted. It really helps to make sure that we can hear the presentations clearly and we don't have a lot of background noise. If you do have questions, feel free to start throwing them in the chat group and uh, or the chat box on the side and we will use that as the platform for Richard to answer questions at the end. Some of you did submit quest questions in advance and so I believe Richard's included some of those in his presentation uh, and those are the questions that we're going to address before we go to the open question and answer forum. And then lastly, this session is being recorded. And so afterwards, uh, so at some point this week, we'll make sure that you receive a copy of the recording. So if, uh, if there was something that you really wanted to go back and listen to, you can do that. And we'll also uh, link into Richard's presentation. I know yesterday he had some really helpful links within it uh, that people could click off to to find some more information. And so we'll make sure that you have that as well. The partners today who uh, came together to work with you, so City of Fourth Lakes Economic Development, we have our Fourth Lakes Small Business and Entrepreneurship Center and uh, the Health Unit, as well as our partners with the uh, four different Chambers of Commerce and the Lindsay Downtown BIA worked really hard to hopefully sort of get this session into your inboxes and make you aware that it was happening and uh, direct you to more information if you needed so. And then really quickly, uh, the City of Quartha Lakes is really committed to supporting businesses uh, and your events during sort of this recovery from the COVID-19 pandemic. And that recovery takes a number of different avenues. Uh, we have the Economic Recovery Task Force, which is led by the mayor, uh, a team of sort of staff and community leaders. We have underneath that economic recovery task force working groups. So we've met individually with uh, people from 10 different industry sectors, uh, the main industry sectors along Kawartha Lakes who are providing input to that task force to, to help guide recovery to make sure that it's relevant and supporting the businesses in our community. We have uh, Team Kawartha Lakes, which is a group of about 16 different business support organizations that work with many of the businesses in Kawartha Lakes and offer different programs and services. And they're currently meeting on sort of, they started it weekly, now bi-weekly and uh, monthly to try and make sure that uh, all of the recommendations that are coming out from our businesses and the input that we've heard are helping to guide recovery uh, initiatives across all different business support organizations. And then uh, one of the things that we have done is sort of business interviews and surveys. So right at the beginning, uh, when COVID hit and everybody was sort of starting to feel the effects, uh, we've had connections. I think there was just over 500 business interviews and surveys that we've conducted to really help guide the direction that we go and make sure that it's relevant and supportive to you. And so this is, these sessions are coming out of a lot of the feedback that we've heard from uh, all of the different businesses and organizations across the city. And so I hope that uh, it hits home for you and is, uh, is helpful. So the next part, which is sort of why you're all here is to listen to Richard. Richard is the manager of health protection at the Halliburton Kawartha Pine Ridge District uh, Unit. Halliburton Kawartha Pine Ridge District Health Unit. Uh, Richard's worked in public health for 24 years, both in Alberta and Ontario. He has been uh, working with the local health unit for the past 17 years as the manager of health protection. And in this role, Richard's responsible for food safety, rabies, uh, vector-borne diseases like mosquito and tick surveillance programs, and has really been uh, a partner to the city and our team of uh, organizations to really help make sure that we're getting the most relevant and accurate information into your hands as things change so rapidly. Uh, so with that, I'm going to stop sharing my screen. I'm going to pass it over to Richard, who's going to share his screen and he's going to start through his presentation. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, big thank you to uh... To Carly, Sandy, uh, Chamber of Commerce, BIA, and all of you that are participating today. 
uh, before I start sharing my presentation, I uh, just wanted to say a couple things. Uh, first, uh, first off, the uh, information that is going to be presented today is a as accurate as of yesterday. So things, as you can imagine, change very rapidly with the COVID-19. Uh, you know, it, it started uh, in Canada with the enactment of the, uh, the emergency. Uh, on March 17th and ever since then it has changed almost on a weekly basis so the information that we provide to you today uh, is is as good as as of today uh, it may change uh, uh, very quickly also the information that we're I'm going to be presenting is for education and information it's not legal advice so if there's any uh, questions legally that you have you might want to consider speaking with uh, an attorney uh, to make sure that you get the the proper legal advice. Uh, also, I wanted to mention that the health unit has a website that we've set up for all of the COVID-19 uh, information. I'm just going to share that with you. Can, can you see that, Carly? Yep. Okay. So... Uh, uh, the when you first click on our website and the uh, the website for the health unit is www.hkpr.on.ca and you scroll down there's a big COVID-19 it gives you um, uh, all of the number of cases that we have in our jurisdiction uh, so confirmed cases current probable all of the stuff that you wanted to know if you had any questions of how we're doing in our area it has a, an information section in here. It has the resources. So if there's any uh, uh, signs, uh, anything like that, that we've made printable and that you can download and use for, for yourself, they're located here. There's some media blogs and then there's Q and A's. So if there's any questions that we don't get to today, uh, feel free to go to this section right here. And it has a lot of questions uh, that, that we've already answered uh, because we've uh, set up a, uh, a call center and we record all of our all of the questions that uh, people have and we provide responses to. So the ones that are uh, uh, people asking about more frequently are the ones that we actually posted on here. So with that said, I'm going to share the presentation screen. Sec here. Okay, can everybody see the uh, the presentation? Yeah, looks good, Richard. Perfect. Okay, excellent. Thank you. Uh, <clears throat> so the first first slide I have in here, there are some useful uh, links that you can use. When you get a copy of the presentation, there is the framework, the regulations, there's 36 different regulations that are in play under the emergency. There's two acts. Uh, one was the Emergency Management um, a Civil Protection Act, and the other one is the uh, Reopening Ontario Act, uh, which has just been enacted um, as of Friday, uh, July 24th. So all of the regulations that were that under the EMCPA have now been, have now been moved under the, the new act. There's once again, some printable uh, resources for you, uh, Public Health Ontario fact sheets and the masking requirements. So in order for public health to be effective in curb tailing the COVID-19 outbreak, and it's not just the COVID-19 outbreak, but any outbreak, it, there's there's number of public health measures that we need to implement, okay? And it's absolutely critical that we all do our part. If you think about this COVID-19, uh, you can think of something like a grass fire or a forest fire. If you contain it right at the source, 
you have a much better chance to, to prevent it from spreading and becoming a, a, a huge disaster. In Canada, largely we've done a really good job in preventing uh, the COVID-19 to, uh, you know, from, from becoming a disastrous situation. And as I discussed with Carly earlier on, when public health is doing its job right, you don't see the same kind of effects that you would if we missed, had a misstep. So if we had a misstep and we had a huge outbreak with multiple like hundreds and thousands and, and that kind of stuff, those deaths, um, then every, everybody would be uh, in, in a panic. When public health is doing a job, it's preventing that from happening. And that's what we wanna see. And that's what, I, what is actually happening. So some of those uh, top uh, guiding principles of public health is uh, maintain your physical distancing of uh, two meters. Uh, wash your hands frequently. Like th these are things that your, your mom and your grandma taught you. And we're finally uh, coming back and, and uh, uh, learning about them all, all, all over again. Uh, if you can't have, can't wash your hands because the hand wash station is not available. Now we have these uh, um, hand sanitizers readily available. You can have it in your pocket, in your purse, in your vehicle. Uh, so use those. Practice good uh, hygiene and, and cough etiquette. So cough or sneeze into your sleeve to prevent it from being splattered uh, further uh, at a longer distance. There's been some uh, general guidance uh, around number of people that can gather. And this is set by the province right now and is being relaxed based on how we do. So the province takes their direction from the chief medical officer of health. And the chief medical officer of health has routine meetings with all of the local medical office, officers of health of the 34 different health units. And based on what's happening in, in the local settings, uh, there is recommendations made to the chief medical officer of health who then makes his uh, recommendation to the premier. Right now, we're at 50 people indoors, 100 people outdoors, okay? Self-monitoring and staying home when ill is absolutely crucial. If we are to stop the spread of the disease, we need to make sure that people that are sick don't go into the public. If you, have, uh, if you are sick and you need your groceries, obviously, see if somebody else can bring those to you. There is a number of services that deliver uh, gross groceries to, uh, to people. So take advantage of those. Wear face covering when indoors or when physical distancing is a, is a challenge. This has been uh, a really divisive issue for not a good reason. When we look at some of the countries in Europe and in Asia that have had success in curtailing COVID-19, they, they utilized number of me uh, measures. The face covering is one of them. It's not one or the other. It's all of these things together minimize the, the risk to, to our fellow men and, and uh, people that we we uh, congregate with. There's a new app that's coming up. It's called the COVID Alert app. And when uh, it becomes available and should be coming out within the week, next week or so, it will, no be, uh, it will notify you once you download it of any individual that also has downloaded the, the app and is positive. And the way that this works is the individual uh, Will, will be tested. And with the result comes a 10 digit number. That number is then uh, typed into the, uh, the data set by the individual. And there is no personal information. There is no information shared other than the fact that there is somebody in the area that you have come in contact with that was positive for COVID. And what Knowledge is power. So what you can then do is have yourself tested to, to be sure that you have not been infected. People that are traveling need to quarantine themselves for 14 days after international travel. 
this is a federal requirement and is, is actually enforced by the RCMP or OPP and local police. Uh, the way that, that it works, the RCMP uh, provides the information to the local police services uh, and, and then they're required to, to follow up. Get tested if you have any symptoms or are worried that you were con in contact with anybody with COVID-19. Once again, knowledge is power and it's a peace of mind. Especially if you're around anybody that's vulnerable, uh, you wanna make sure that uh, you know if you're, if you're infected and you can then protect uh, your family, your loved ones, and your, the people that you work with. Uh, under, the, there's, um, under the legislation, uh, there's a requirement to follow direction of public health officials. So this is right in the act. And there is special instructions that are issued by local medical office of health. The reason why it's left so generic is to be able to maneuver as the outbreaks uh, change over time. So if there is a local situation that happens, we need to be able to quickly uh, mobilize and do whatever it takes to, to snuff that out. That doesn't mean that the whole province needs to follow suit. So that's why you see, see the uh, masking requirements, for example, in areas like uh, the GTA, uh, the Quarthas, uh, it's starting in Peterborough. But you're, you're not likely to see it in somewhere like Thunder Bay where they don't have the same kind of uh, visitors, the same kind of issues that we're facing. So I think this was a really smart move to, to allow the local MOHs to be able to uh, issue certain directives based on local uh, issues. So we're gonna get right into the restaurants and bars. In the new regulation 364, uh, there are certain things that are not permitted yet. So not permitted at this time are buffet services, and private karaoke rooms, okay? Staff uh, in, in any of the uh, food premises and any businesses for that matter, must self-isolate, sorry, must self-monitor for illness and stay home when ill. So when we were reopening all of the businesses in stage two, uh, businesses had to go through setting up and preparing their, their plans, their pandemic plans for operation. If you recall, uh, there was uh, the grocery stores were identified as uh, essential services, but we had to make sure that there is certain steps that are taken by the operators to make sure that people don't get sick. So the continuous self-monitoring of employees is absolutely critical. This prevents, once again, people that are sick from getting into, into the work environment. There's a lot of questions on uh, the uh, maximum allowable uh, people in food premises. Uh, so right now, the way that the regulation is written, there is no restriction on the maximum capacity but the restriction is that you have to make sure that people are two meters away from each other. So that physical distancing must be maintained. So depending on the size of your facility, you'll be able to, to fit more people into your establishment. And it's not two meters from table to table, it's two meters from individual to individual, okay? Now there is a caveat. caveat. If you have uh, people um, uh, performing, singing, dancing, uh, then automatically it moves you to section 11 of the, of the regulation 364, which imposes a maximum limit of 50 indoors or 100 outdoors, okay? The 50 and, a, and 100 cannot be combined for 150. It's 50 or 100. Uh, patrons may sing if separated by plexiglass and maintain two meter distance 
and they must clean the equipment in between. So if, if there is a, uh, somebody singing, uh, they're using a microphone, you're going to have to make sure that you, you wipe down the microphone before uh, passing it to the next person. Remember that I mentioned karaoke rooms are still forbidden. That is true. Uh, so when we're talking about singing, this is not in a small karaoke room. This is in the facility. But once again, just make sure that you have the plexiglass and you have uh, adequate separation between people. Tables must be uh, two meters apart, uh, or you, you can use barriers such as plexiglass. Bars can only open for, to provide food or drinks. So you can't have bars like dance bars and clubs uh, where people are mingling, uh, like you've seen in, in uh, some of the news coverage that, uh, that have been happening. Uh, that's still illegal and is, char is a chargeable offense. Patrons must be seated when eating or drinking. Patrons are required to wear masks until seated in HKPR. So HKPR, Halliburton Kawartha Pine Ridge District Health Unit covers city of Kawartha Lakes, all of Halliburton County and all of Northumberland County. And servers and staff working in a public area are also required to wear a mask. So public area is anywhere where the public have access to. So um, your, your dining area, your uh, hallways, uh, areas where like washrooms, uh, anywhere in those areas, uh, staff need to wear masks. If you have a facility uh, like a restaurant, for example, people in the kitchen are not required to wear a mask provided that they maintain two meters from, from one another, okay? Likewise, if you have a stock room and somebody's working in a stock room or in an office uh, and it's, there's no access of public into those areas, those individuals are not required to wear masks unless they can't maintain the two meter distance from one, on, one another. Uh, we need to continue increased sanitation of high, high touch surfaces. So high touch surfaces in, uh, in a restaurant setting uh, would be your handles, your tables, chairs, uh, could be the kiosk, uh, the, the machine that you pay with. Uh, if you have a, an ATM machine, that's a high touch surface. So just think of uh, bathrooms, for example. Think of areas where people are actually touching them and, and uh, make sure that those are uh, cleaned and disinfected. Recommend using reservation to stagger uh, customer entry if you can. This is to maintain the number of people that are coming in and not overcrowding. Outdoor dining must be in or adjacent to the place of business. So this is your patio requirements and that's part of your municipal uh, requirements uh, based on uh, your, your uh, bylaws. Outdoor dining also requires that a roof, canopy, or tent is allowed, but must be open on two sides, okay? So you can't have uh, a structure that's erect with, uh, with only one side open. It has to have at least two sides open. So that's the, the general uh, requirements under the regu regulation. So we were, we're gonna get into a little bit of a safe operation and I just wanted to highlight the Ministry of uh, Labor, uh, some requirements. So as an employer, you're still required to protect your staff. And if you have anybody that comes down with COVID-19, you're required to uh, discuss it with, uh, with the Joint Health and Safety Committee, if you have one, and you're required to also report it to the Ministry of Labor if WSIB has been involved. And also workers have the right to uh, refuse unsafe work. So I just wanted to let you know. There's some controls that the Ministry of Labor is also uh, highlighting and, and Ministry of Labor is doing inspections and we're actually doing joint inspections uh, with Ministry of Labor on a number of uh, fronts. So very similar to what, uh, what we talked about, there's a couple other things that uh, the Ministry has, uh, has implemented also the wearing of gloves for certain tasks or for certain positions, uh, laundering your, uh, your clothing uh, after a shift, uh, 
uh, make sure you, you come to work with clean laundry. Um, minimize contact with, uh, with customers if at all possible. You might want to consider stagger, staggering lunches of employees, uh, staggering work schedules, cleaning once again, and uh, post rules and policies for staff to be, to be able to see and follow. So with the posting also comes a requirement for training. Um, operators are, are supposed to have COVID-19 work, workplace safety plans. If you don't have one, uh, this link will take you to a document that will help you, help walk you through a process on how to develop a COVID-19 workplace safety plan. It will help prepare your, uh, put, your, put some controls into place for your specific type, type of business. As an employer, it's your responsibility under the Occupational Health and Safety Act to take every precaution reasonable in the circumstance to prevent, uh, protect the worker. And this guide, once again, will help you uh, plan for, for that situation. If possible, create, discuss, and share your plan before workers return to the workplace and review the plan uh, with them regularly. Stay on top of things. There's a number of resources, once again, that uh, you can access through this link for, that are sector specific. So the province has done an excellent job in queuing up uh, resources for all of the sectors or, or majority of the sectors. So there is in, a, uh, in upwards of 80 or some odd uh, uh, documents that, that are uh, posted for various different sectors. So do take a look um, and uh, you, you will be able to find, uh, well, there's de definitely stuff for food services and, uh, and those sectors. And make sure you continue to follow any provincial orders as well as any local public health directives. So as a, as a business owner, it's your responsibility to be aware of the laws that govern your business, whether it's the food, uh, food premises regulation or any emergency regulations that are in place, uh, it's your responsibility to be aware of them and abide by them. So we're going to get into some uh, special events, some information. Um, this is a great picture that I found on how um, a drive-in theater or an event should look like. You can see the, uh, the distance uh, maintained, nobody outside uh, on lawn chairs. We'll talk about that a little later. So for live shows, performing arts, and movie theaters, uh, there is the gathering limit of 50 people indoors and, and or uh, 100 people outdoors. And you cannot combine the two. Employees and performers are not included in the maximum limit. So the 50 people indoors are on top of all of your staff. Physical distance is, uh, distancing is required, so you still have to make sure that you maintain that physical distance. We've had some events already uh, where there's been some concerts, uh, so we are following up with the operators to make sure that they have people in place to be able to monitor and address issues as they arise so we don't, we don't have a problem on our hands. If you're gonna have any singers, the singers have to be separated along with the players of brass instruments by an in, uh, impermeable barrier such as plexiglass. Still have to maintain that two meter distance and if there is anybody else that's gonna be utilizing the equipment, it has to be cleaned in between use. Patrons are required to wear masks in all public areas indoors, except when seated. So you don't have to wear a mask outdoors. It's recommended that you wear a mask outdoors if you can't maintain 
the two meter distance. So if you're going to an, an area and there's a lot of people, uh, it's recommended that you put the mask on. But it's not mandated outdoors. Organ organizers of special events involving sale of food must notify the health unit. This is nothing new. This, is, this, this has always been in place. There is a, an application for a special event that's on our website. And I'm just reminding people to continue with that process. And this falls under the food premises regulation that has been in place for, for a long time. Coming soon, uh, we've been told, um, our director sits on the uh, meeting with the um, medical officers of health that uh, very soon there should be an amendment uh, that will allow cinemas, convention centers, and casinos to allow more than 50 people. Right now, the way that, that the regulation is written is you can have only 50 people in the entire facility. So if you think about uh, Cineplex Odeon that has uh, five or six movie theaters, it's not 50 people per movie theater. It's 50 people for the entire uh, Cineplex audio, uh, which, which doesn't really make much sense. Uh, so there is an amendment coming up where we're just waiting for that. There is still some restrictions uh, with respect to the 50 and the 100 uh, that I mentioned. And uh, yesterday at yesterday's talk, I, I mentioned that uh, we've had a, an application from the late Lindsay exhibition uh, to have an event where they have number of buildings but because those buildings are on one, on one lot, one geographic location, the way that the regulation is written, we have to apply the 50 indoors or 100 outdoors to the entire facility, which once again, doesn't really make much sense. But because it's written in a regulation, we can't just, uh, you know, a snap of a finger, change uh, the, the, the way that we enforce the regulation. So what the province has done is you can apply for an exemption. And what you, the way that you can do that is you submit a proposal to the Office of the Chief Medical Officer of Health under this stage three operation by clicking on this link over here, ontario.ca slash reopen. When you scroll down to the bottom of the page on the right hand side, the, you click on it and the, the, that takes you to an application for, uh, for a proposal. Uh, you submit that and government officials will work collaboratively with sectors that are developing the plans to safely reopen. They review the information and then they get back to, to individuals. When you submit those plans, please make sure that you're as detailed as possible with respect to measures that you will take to implement to, implement to uh, protect the, uh, the health of the patrons and your, your staff as well, okay? Drive-in venues. So drive-in cinemas, concert, theatrical performances may open. There is no minimum limit of the 100, provided that individuals stay in their vehicles and the vehicles as written in the regulation must have a roof and doors. Okay, so if you have a uh, cabriolet with your top down, you got to put that top back up. Patrons must remain in the vehicle. So we don't want to see any lawn chairs. Once again, if people don't follow the, the rules, the way that they're written, uh, it will have an effect. Number one, you can be charged uh, under the, uh, the new regulation um, and the under the act. And two, it will have an effect on uh, future events being approved. Um, the only time people can uh, leave their vehicles is to purchase an admission, food or beverage, or to ac uh, access the washroom. What if there's a case of COVID-19 in a workplace? So anyone confirmed or suspected of being positive for COVID-19 must refrain from work. They must self-isolate at home. 
and any co close contact should immediately take the online assessment tool. And once again, I have a link on what that assessment tool is. So you can click on it and, and follow it and, and complete that self-assessment tool. Anybody that's considered a high-risk contact uh, will also be contacted by the health unit. And a high-risk contact is someone that was in close proximity uh, to, to the individual that's positive for a prolonged period of time. So they were you know, closer than the, the two meters for a prolonged period, or somebody like sneezed or coughed on them, okay? Contacts may, uh, oh, sorry, uh, employers uh, need to stress uh, physical distancing, wearing masks, clean and disinfect high touch surfaces, and all of the other public health messages that I highlighted at the beginning of the presentation. Non-medical masks and face coverings. So why did we put this requirement in? This was a decision made uh, by the medical officer of health, Dr. Noseworthy. And we wanted to make sure that as we reopen the businesses uh, in stage three, we are getting more people coming from areas that have a lot more COVID-19 activity. I mean, Kawartha Lakes, Halliburton, uh, Northumberland County. They're all areas that people love to visit to vacation in and we, we want their business. But in order for us to make sure that we protect ourselves and the, uh, the other patrons that we have, we have implemented the, the masking uh, requirement. And the masking requirement is only on, in indoor settings. Okay. So what are businesses actually required to do? So businesses must have a policy in place. And the health unit has sent out uh, with the support of uh, economic de development and, and chamber of commerce and our partners that are putting this talk on, they've helped uh, provide this information, move this information to the businesses. So you already have a template. Please complete that template or develop your own policy for that matter. Uh, Business owners need to have signs that direct uh, customers, patrons uh, to wear masks upon entry indoors. Business owners are required to have a, a training session for their staff about their policy and how to address individuals. And the only requirement that we have in addition to that is to actively inform clients that are not wearing a mask of the directive that was issued. There is no expectation at any time that you need to stop people from entering your business. That's your decision, but there is no mandatory requirement to, to prevent you from allowing people without a mask to enter, enter your business. The, the legal requirement you have is to let those individuals know that there is a directive that was issued by the medical officer of health, okay? There is certain uh, exemptions in the directive that was issued. Uh, one is on the age of the, uh, the children, so anybody under the age of two or anybody that's under the age of five, either chronologically or developmentally, and you can't get a mask on them or they're not willing to, uh, they're exempt. People that have medical conditions are exempt. People that are not able to put on a mask uh, due to various different uh, ailments. And there are some religious uh, exemptions. And I don't know what those religious exemptions are. That, that was a, a legal thing that was put on, but um, I, I'm not specifically aware. Uh, employees uh, who work in areas that serve the public must also wear masks. So once again, so if your, um, if your staff are working, your servers, uh, people that are greeting uh, in, indoors or they come into uh, close uh, contact with individuals, anytime they're in a pu public area, those staff have to wear masks. A lot of questions on weddings. So wedding ceremony uh, held in a building other than your private dwelling shall be 30% capacity. 
as it stands now. Gathering limits for reception. So once you, you uh, leave the church or whatever a place of worship you're, you're getting married on in, and you go to a reception, then the gathering limits of 50 indoors or 100 up, outdoors apply. Mas masks must be worn indoors by all participants until they're seated, except a priest or minister or the person that's, uh, that's performing the ceremony during the ceremony and the bride and groom uh, while they're, they're uh, in the process of, of their uh, vows. So during the ceremony, those individuals don't need to wear masks. Um, they follow within uh, the, their social circles. Um, and uh, I, I think that's a pretty reasonable exemption. Remember, you can't combine the indoor and outdoor uh, gathering limits. Physical distancing requirements still apply. There is no buffet style service. So all of the food has to be plated, uh, no buffet. Patrons seated at different tables are to be two meters apart for your physical distancing again. Uh, performers singing, dancing, or playing brass instruments. We talked about that already. They have to be separated by an impermeable uh, barrier of some sort, such as plexiglass. They have to maintain two meter distance and uh, they have to clean uh, the instruments between use. So we've had some questions that were sent out to us and I've prepared um, the, the Q&A. One of the questions that we often get from, uh, from people uh, in the business industry uh, is, is there a risk of hypoxia or not enough oxygen being able to be absorbed related to wearing masks? And I know it gets hot. Um, my wife works at a nursing home in the food service uh, section and they're required to wear, wear masks nonstop. So I know exactly what, uh, what you guys are talking about. Um, the research that we've done uh, suggests that unlike N95 masks, medical masks and non-medical face coverings do not form a complete seal around the mouth or nose. Therefore, these non-medical masks and face coverings are recommended uh, to the public and to the staff in order uh, for them to, to be able to wear it and it does not create this hypoxia. Okay. Now, you gotta keep in mind that it will reduce the transmission by, of the infectious agents by stopping the respiratory droplets at the source. Uh, it protects the, the, the individual that, sorry, it doesn't protect the wearer of the mask as much as it protects the individual that's on the other side, because it stops that, uh, that those droplet, resp respiratory droplet. Also, if an individual is uh, working a shift at eight to 12 hours long, uh, that mask will need to be changed because it will get moist. And whenever it is moist or dirty, it needs to be changed uh, to, to make sure that uh, it's easier to breathe through and it doesn't have any, any germs. The information that I just presented, uh, here's the references to, to the information that I, I've included, okay? If you, if you really wanna look at, look at it, uh, feel free. We had a question about coat racks. Can people hang their coats, outside coats together on a rack or do they have to separate? Uh, so since people are encouraged to sneeze and cough into their sleeves, as part of their, the, the etiquette, the um, respiratory etiquette, uh, it's not advisable to have uh, coats one on top of the other. So, you know, have those coats uh, separated. Masks. Uh, I have seen people wearing dickies. Is that good enough? They look like they're made out of knit fabric or whatever fabric. So once again, yes because we're not, uh, like the intent of these masks is to protect the other individual, not the wearer of the mask. But if you think about if, they, if the source individual 
or your staff member wears a mask and the client wears a mask, now you have a double protection. Okay? Once again, we're building on those protections. So a cloth mask is in intended to, draw, uh, to trap the droplets uh, that are released and uh, through talking, coughing, sneezing. And yes, it, it has the, the effect. It's not going to filter out uh, all of, you know, bacteria or viruses that the individual might have. But the, the, the virus that we're talking about is predominantly in the droplets and the droplets uh, don't go very far. Next question regarding weddings. And I think we've already covered this one, but I put it in there again because it had a number of sub questions in there. So uh, regarding weddings and large gatherings, end of life ceremonies as to maximums for ceremonies or receptions, does that include kids and babies? Uh, there's nothing written that would exempt them from not including kids. So as long as the kids are running around, uh, I would say, yes, it includes the kids. Uh, small babies, if they're uh, in a carrier, I, I don't think we would be counting those. But once again, I'm not a, I'm not a legal expert. I see we got words, uh, legal services here. So maybe they can uh, weigh in later on and provide some guidance. Uh, an indoor event uh, gathering cannot be combined with an outdoor event gathering to increase your, your limits. Person attending the event shall comply with uh, the guidance of the physical distancing. Restrictions apply even if the wedding is help, held in a private dwelling. So this is important. So just because you, you're holding it in a private dwelling doesn't mean that you can't transmit the, the infection and cause another uh, outbreak that needs to be uh, stamped out. Okay? And we have to be careful uh, on, on what we do because we want to keep on moving into uh, stage uh, phase three or stage four of our recovery. We don't want to go backwards. Still under the uh, wedding questions, serve meals or buffets, so no buffet style, that's directly in the regulation. Mask or no mask, uh, we talked about that. Masks are required indoors, in the place of worship, or anywhere indoors until people are seated. Bride, groom, and the priest or minister is not required to wear a mask during the ceremony. But as they go back into, uh, uh, into the uh, mingling uh, area, uh, they will need to put on a mask. Uh, bars, bar is permitted, but only to serve food or drink, and people must be seated when eating or drinking. So once again, a bar cannot have the, the big dances that we're used to. Question five, uh, how can food be served? We sometimes have bowls of chips and nuts after a game. Is this possible now or should uh, food be, or, or no, should, no, no food should be served? So there is no, no pro prohibition of food. Food can, can be served, food is an essential, the service of food is still an essential service. Uh, we've opened up the restaurants, uh, actually the restaurants were always open uh, for, for takeout. Now we're in stage three, so you know, yes, you can have food. Um, it's recommended that food be served in individual containers uh, to people that are not from the same family or social circle. Uh, people that are from the same family, uh, there's no restriction on, on uh, sharing food with them. Face shields, should masks be worn with them? Yes. So the best available evidence that we have at this time is that face shields are not as effective as masks. They're substandard. They do prevent uh, some uh, release of the um, of this moisture spit as people talk, uh, but masks uh, should be worn underneath. Now face shields um, at minimum should be below the chin and kind of curve around the, the face. And the World Health Organization supports the use of face shield as a better than nothing alternative um, to face masks for population who are not able to properly wear a non-medical mask 
or individuals that have respiratory conditions. So when, when we run into situation with uh, businesses and some of your staff may have some of these uh, conditions, then face shields would be more than appro appropriate for them. What kind of clean up cleaners should we use to wipe down plastic tables and chrome chairs? Need something that won't stain upholstery or carpets, easy to, to use and won't hurt the hands on a person. That's a, that's a big ask. But um, commonly used cleaners and disinfectants are effective against COVID-19, okay? So there's cleaners, there's disinfectants, and then there's the disinfectant wipes. Um, COVID-19 can survive on different surfaces, but like I mentioned, they are able to be killed by cleaners and disinfectants. I've included a chart of disinfectants for various different purposes and how to mix them. And it has information on uh, some of the pros and cons of those disinfectants. So um, if, you, if you look at this link in here, when you get the presentation, just click it, it'll take you directly to, to that chart. And that's developed by Public Health Ontario. Uh, and uh, use only disinfectants that have a drug identification number because they've been approved to be used in Canada. Okay, and then there's uh, another document in here that, you, that I have a link to that talks a little more about disinfectants. Can an event plan use an approach of 50 or 100 people at one time? so that they can ultimately accommodate more than that number over the, the course of a longer event, similar to the approach of a certain capacity at a restaurant or church where there is capacity limit at one time. Could an event that happens over a day long time frame just limit the number of people admitted to the appropriate number of indoors or outdoors at one time? So yes. The gathering limit that's identified under Regulation 36420 applies to the number of people at any given time. So once people leave, you, you don't have the 50 people there, more people can come in, okay? You just need to make sure that you have a handle on the number of people that are in your facility. Can an event such as Kawartha Farmers which employs multiple sites, use the 50 or 100 person limit at each site rather than across the entire event. That depends. If the sites are not located in one location on one lot, then it would be acceptable to use the gathering limit of 50 or 100 at each site. Okay, so let's say you have an event, uh, we were planning for the, um, it's not happening right now, but we were, we were uh, planning for the plowing match, if you think about it. And, and the plowing match had a proposal where they had an event here at the Lindsay Exhibition, but they also had a number of other locations. So each location would be, would be able to have the 50, but if it was just at the Lindsay Exhibition, that uh, that venue would be limited to 50 indoors or 100 outdoors. Okay. And I think that's all I have for, uh, for the presentation. That's great, Richard. Thank you so much. Uh, we have, we are uh, just about 10 o'clock and I realized that we had scheduled this from nine until 10. We do have a number of questions who have come through on the private chat. So we're gonna continue on. If you are no longer able to join us, if you've got to open up your restaurant uh, or business or just need to move on to your day, uh, feel free to log off and we'll just make sure that you have the recording. Uh, otherwise, we will go through the uh, questions that were submitted in the chat box. So uh, Richard, the first question that I have here is, uh, what are your thoughts on quarantine after interprovincial travel? given the lack of consistency among the provinces on this issue? So the quarantine is a federal requirement after inter international travel, okay? So that's not something that the province has come up with. That's something that the federal government has mandated and it must be followed. 
So I think the question is specific province to province. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, I don't think there is a requirement for, for quarantining uh, interprovincially. But I would have to look, that, look into that a little, little, uh, little more. Jason, that was your question. If you want to provide a little more clarity, feel free to unmute. Oh, we can't hear you. Um, thanks, Richard. That presentation was excellent. So the question was, um, the provinces don't seem to have a uniform approach to traveling interprovincially. Uh, there have been instances where uh, residents of a certain province have, have had some conflict with license plates from other provinces showing up uh, at vacation spots. And given that there's no federal um, rule on this, do you have any thoughts about whether people who travel here from another province should also be required to quarantine for 14 days? Or do you think that's unnecessary at this point? Well, I, I think that uh, that's an excellent question, by the way, uh, but it's, it's above my pay grade. Uh, this is a, a requirement that goes through, or, or this is a question that needs to be channeled more towards the Chief Medical Officer of Health and the Premier's office. Uh, I know there's a number of provinces that have required, so for example, some of the maritime provinces have required the, uh, the uh, quarantine for people that are entering their, um, their provinces. At least that was the case in stage two. I'm not sure if they've removed those requirements. In Ontario, we've never had that interprovincially. Uh, so it's, it's not something that I would feel comfortable uh, weighing in on. Um, you know, d definitely if there is... Uh, international travel from from countries that are that that are experiencing uh significant issues like we have in our uh to, to our uh, neighbors to the south then uh, that needs to be be followed and that is already covered but eventually i, I really don't have uh not something that i can i can uh respond to fair enough thank you thank you uh, so moving on, a uh, scenario for you, Richard. I'm currently enjoying dinner at the patio at the Pie-Eyed Monk. I leave my table to use the washroom inside the facility. I must wear my mask as soon as leaving my table until I sit back down under the Ministry of Health Directive. Is that correct? Correct, yes. Thank you. Are wait staff on an outdoor patio required to wear a mask? Yes, they are. And part of the reason there is that the wait staff go in inside to get the food and then come outside. So they're indoors and outdoors. But also, if you think about it, the wait staff bring your food and they, they get into that within that two meter uh, physical distance. So once again, it's there to protect the client that is sitting down uh, paying for a meal. Another scenario for you, a customer enters my retail facility and refuses to wear a mask. Per the directive, I educate that person and use good faith politely to request the mask for entry. The customer refuses and remains in the facility. I do not wish to engage in more conflict. Do I call the health unit? What will they be able to do right away given this customer is upsetting others in my facility? So this is a question that we've got quite a bit. And the legal obligation for the business owner ends when they approach the individual and advise them of the uh, directive that was issued to wear masks. Uh, keep in mind that there is a number of reasons why people might not be able to wear a mask. And if, if we put it into a spectrum, we have people that are so scared, they're still not coming out of their homes. Um, and then we have people that don't believe that COVID-19 is happening and they're not willing to, uh, to wear a mask. And then we have everybody in between. Uh, and most people, even if they don't believe that the issue is as bad as, uh, or as necessary to wear masks, are willing to obey the, the law. So we're, we're talking about, uh, the compliance rate of people in the high 80s even, or even more. So 
there may be good reason that the individual is not wearing a mask. All that we would suggest uh, or advise the, the, the business owner is inform them of the requirement and leave it at that. Thanks, Richard. Next question is, is there any issue with staff members who for health reasons cannot wear a mask or a face covering? That's another excellent question. Uh, so if, so, so legally, because the directive is legally binding because it's written under the emergency act. Now it's the reopening Ontario act. Okay. So it is legally binding. So if a staff member is not able to wear a mask for whatever reason, whether it's uh, medical or, or whatever reason uh, they have, the employer has some options. The employer can either provide them with a visor or another type of uh, protective equipment that'll protect uh, the, the clients from the individual and vice versa. Or uh, depending on the type of business, they can change that individual's assignment. So instead of uh, working in the front as a server, that individual may, may have to work uh, in a different assignment. The next question is, we keep a daily visitor log. Is that a requirement that is mandatory? What is the business? Uh, Tammy, that was your question. If you're still on, can you unmute to clarify? Restaurant. Restaurant. Okay. So for restaurants, no, there's no requirement for you to maintain uh, a, a log of people that have entered uh, because there's no minimum requirement of number or sorry ma ma no ma maximum requirement of the number of people that are allowed in your facility provided that you maintain that two meter distance the uh, the requirement for people to keep uh, keep the, the list of individuals that are attending is more for personal service settings there has been an outbreak down in Kingston and it assists public health in being able to do a very quick contact trace so we don't allow that, that forest fire to kind of burn out of control uh, until we can't control it anymore. Okay. Thank you. Uh, the next question is, are there any guidelines for what increased sanitation and disinfection means? Is daily disinfection sufficient when previously it was done weekly or does it need to be more frequent? So it needs to be more frequent, yes. So we, when we talk about increased uh, cleaning and disinfection of high touch surfaces, we're talking of, of at least two times a day uh, or more frequently as required. So it depends on the usage, it depends on the number of people that are coming through your facility, uh, but at minimum two times a day. I don't, if I can just add, at our facility at the health unit, uh, we have staff, uh, cleaning staff that come in at lunchtime to clean all of the um, you know, handrails and, and doorknobs and all of the high touch surfaces. And this is not even an area that, that has uh, public coming through. So this is just our own staff. The next question, social bubbles are now 10 people. Does this mean a group of more than six, the previous number, can be seated together? Should the six people per table be maintained for a restaurant again? Yeah, you can sit six people from the same uh, social group together. That's not a problem. Can that be extended to 10 now? Yes. If you have tenants in your building and you are holding an event, would the tenants patrons count toward the 50 maximum patrons at the event? Yes. So if they're, if they're uh, part of the event, then yes, they would be counted as, as uh, part of the event unless they're in, involved in putting the event on. So the staff that or the people, the volunteers that are used to put the event on are not counted in that total number. But if those individuals are part of the 
uh, the group that, are, that is enjoying the event, not necessarily working the event, then they're counting. Amy, does that answer your question clearly? Uh, not exactly. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to clarify. So they wouldn't be part of the event. So we have a multi, um, uh, forget the terminology, but we have three commercial stop, um, uh, tenants in our building. So if um, one of the tenants, so be it us, if we were holding an event in our space, would we have to coordinate with our tenants to know who's in their space at that same time? Oh, I see. So this is a commercial setting. Yes. What, what kind of uh, businesses are they? Uh, so uh, I run the Boys and Girls Club. So I'm thinking about an event in our space at the Boys and Girls Club, but we have two tenants. One is the gymnastics center and one is Chimo uh, Child and Youth Services. Mm. Uh, Amy, if, if I can get back to you on that one, I don't wanna misspeak on it. Uh, Carly, if you can just jot that question down and I'll, I'll check through the enforcement support line and okay. I, can get, I can get back to you on it, okay? Yep, thank you. Thanks. Thanks, Richard. Uh, the next question is from Janet. How long does the exemption process take for review and approval? Is there lead time required? Yeah, I, I really don't know how long it, it takes. I know I've directed a few people uh, to, the ex to, to that proposal uh, exemption line, but I haven't heard back from them on how quickly they've received the results, so I, I don't know. Uh, the next question is from Stephanie. If you have a gathering with food on a common table, uh, i.e. sandwiches, veggies, desserts, can you have guests come to the table but staff serve the food? So once again, it, it sort of seems like a buffet kind of. So just, just keep that in mind. If it's a buffet type of uh, service, then it can't be... Uh, it, it would not be allowed. If no one has access but your staff and it's protected, so it's not in, in the public area where people have access to it, then it would be no different than uh, somebody walking through and, and uh, a staff person um, plating the, uh, the sandwich uh, to them individually. So it, it all depends how you set it up. But just remember, buffet is not, not approved. Okay. Uh, the next question is uh, from Kelly. Is an outdoor event, is an outdoor event under a canopy or an open-sided tent still considered outdoors? Or if it's under a tent of any kind, is that considered to be indoors? No, outdoor event is an outdoor event. If you have a tent protecting you from from uh, the, the heat or, uh, or uh, you know, the, the elements, rain or whatever else, it's still an outdoor event. Okay. Now, if you have one of those big tents where, where you close all sides, then uh, it, that does not apply. So you got to make sure that the, the sides are open, at least two sides. Kim is asking how do restaurants with both outside and indoor seating fall for capacity, both 50 inside and 50 outside, or do they fall under one or the other only? Neither. So there is, uh, there is no capacity, maximum capacity for restaurants, unless you have the entertainers. So if you have somebody singing or dancing, then you fall under the 50 indoors, and if you have 50 people seated indoors, that's your maximum capacity. If you don't have the entertainers, then you have no maximum limit. The only restriction is that you have to make sure that everybody's two meters away from each other. Okay, thank you. Uh, Denise is asking, how do we deal with a community event, say in a downtown shopping area, that would be a full day or a weekend with people coming and going, but it's very difficult to predict attendance. People are shopping, dining, and enjoying entertainment on the street, uh, an artisan market that's properly distanced, et cetera. So the organizers 
need to keep all of the uh, public health messaging in place. And normally what we would ask is for a proposal for a large event to be submitted so we can review and provide guidance on, uh, on how to run it safely. If you think about it, if you think about our farmer's markets, when we first opened up the farmer's markets, we had to work with the farmer's market of Ontario and our local organizers for farmer's markets to make sure that we have the distancing, we have, uh, you know, some of the cleaning and sanitizing uh, disinfectants or, or hand sanitizers available. Um, limit the number of people that are walking through. That all needs to be considered. Washrooms. Uh, so there's, there's a lot to consider when you're putting on a large event. Uh, and and it, it can't just be done on a spur of a moment. It, it needs some thought behind it. Okay, thank you. Uh, Harry, thank you for clarifying. Uh, Harry Stoddart has said that they were one of the first to submit a proposal uh, for the exemption and still have not heard. So I would say that there's no defined timeline yet. The 10 day turnaround promise is just an acknowledgement that the proposal has been received um, or reviewed, but not to a decision. And so the last question that we have here, Richard, is uh, how is it that a retail store can have more than 50 people present and not required to capture contact info while uh, why can't an event with 100% contact capture in a much larger building not have more people? Yeah, and I'm not saying it all makes sense. Uh, and, and I don't write the regulations. So uh, please don't shoot the messenger. Uh, I, just, I just have to enforce the regulations the way that they're written. And like I said before, not all regulations, uh, sorry, the regulations that, that are written are not uh, written to kind of look at every single type of business an individual or event that an individual may have. So they, they look at what is generally happening in the province and that's, that's what they try to, to address with the regulations. There's always going to be some nuances uh, and things that when you apply it to a specific situation, it really doesn't make sense. And, and the, the case with Harry, uh, is one of those because I fully support the proposal that Harry uh, proposed and I've uh, I flagged it and I, I even sent it to um, uh, Lori Scottsall but once again I'm limited with what I can do with respect to the regulations the way that they're written Thank you for that clarity. So we've got um, just two more minutes here. I'm going to share my screen with you once again, uh, just as a thank you and some extra resources to take with you. And while that's coming up, uh, my colleague Sandy is just going to put up a poll. We just uh, quick 30 seconds want your feedback on this session. Uh, so you should see that pop up on your screen shortly. On the slide here, we've got um, a link to our COVID-19 business resource page that we keep up to date with any new policy changes or information that can support your businesses. Uh, we have a business blog that's focused really on uh, supporting your digital transformation to help get you online. And then if you are not subscribed to the economic development newsletter, we send one out every Thursday uh, with all of up-to-date information and information on sessions like this that are happening. So uh, I see the poll is up there. Uh, take a minute to just fill those out. And if you do want another session like this or found it helpful and have some topics that you've been really, really keen to dig into a little bit more, please throw your ideas in the chat box or send them in the chat to me privately or to my email and we will work with our team uh, on those that are really of interest and demand with the community. Uh, once you've completed your poll, I just want to again uh, thank you and acknowledge you for taking the time out of your morning and sticking with us 20 minutes longer than we had uh, said that we would hold you here. 
And a thank you to Richard and his team at the health unit. They have been really active in supporting your questions and your needs. And I know are there to answer any further questions that you do have uh, as you are navigating this time of reopening and re-welcoming customers and clients into your space. So uh, with that, uh, I just want to thank you again, and I hope that you all have uh, a lovely day, a lovely week, and uh, get outside and enjoy some of the sunshine that we have. Thank you. Bye-bye.